All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see those of you here. And uh, also a kind of uh, an odd welcome, maybe, to those who are uh, going to listen to this um, on tape. We're glad you're here. This is the last of our official um, sort of Emmaus community panels. So for most of you, uh, you're probably aware that during this year, we've spent the year kind of thinking about scripture, how scripture functions, what scripture is, um, how it informs and uh, in, informs us as a, as a community, um, as individuals, and so forth. And so we've entitled this year's process Adventures in Scripture. And this is kind of the culmination where uh, we want to have one last conversation with the pastors, give them a chance to kind of wrap things up a little bit uh, over the various things that we've talked about in terms of interpretation and, and uh, living with Scripture in a variety of ways, um, and give you all a chance to ask any questions that may still be uh, kind of burning in your, in your minds and your hearts about uh, either things you've heard this year or things that we haven't addressed that uh, may come up for you in terms of in terms of your own uh, thinking about scripture, your own use of scripture, and so forth. So this is kind of going to be a little bit of an informal kind of fireside chat uh, kind of uh, mode, if you will. Um, so I will open it up at a certain point after 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes um, of our first kind of round of, of questions with them uh, that I will ask, and then I will open it up to, to you to ask anything that you might want to. Um, and so I'm going to start just with this first question, and um, I'm going to put Charlene, you on the spot first, and then we'll just kind of work around. So one of the most refreshing things about this year's discussions of Scripture has been the space that we've created for honesty about new areas for learning and growth, areas of challenge and doubt, and areas of inspiration and hope. So I'm going to ask you to continue those honest reflections right now. So what are one or two things in the Bible that are challenging or troubling or problematic for you that perhaps if you were honest, you might wish really weren't there? And why? And also, what are one or two things that you're really glad are in Scripture and why? It's okay. <laughs> All you. Small question. Yeah, one, seriously. One question, Let's just parts. ease into this. One so. question, two parts. Yeah. One question, two parts. Um, so I actually think um, my answers to both of those questions, the stuff that I struggle with and the stuff that I'm glad are there, are the same. Um, because it is usually the stuff that I have to wrestle or just like just muscle through, especially in preparing a sermon or something, that when I am able to kind of, and I'm not saying like, understand it completely or solve it or master it, but just get to a place where I'm okay with it um, in any human sense of the word. Um, I find that that is uh, just like a really good reminder to me that God is present in the midst of it all. And so, I mean, it's going to be the same type of things that are generally troubling, the presence of violence, um, or, and I would say probably the most troubling is the presence of inconsistency where we feel like God is not, uh, consistent from one incident to the instance to the next. So I'm actually thinking about, um, an exchange that I had over email with Randy about like, if we have the ability or if we are empowered to bargain with God, I mean, we see this, especially in the old Testament, um, with individuals kind of saying, but God, did you consider, or what about, and all these things. And so um, we had this email exchange, and it, it, A, it kind of dawned on me that, like, we read this, the text in such a way, in such a instructional way that we assume that if God bartered, he must have changed, he or she must have changed God's mind, when maybe it's the conversation itself that is of the importance, right? Um, that in God's omniscience, God knew, for example, how it would all work out, but that exchange, the ability to stand before God and say, well, God, what about this, is empowering for us as individuals to approach the Almighty, um, and especially the instances where we have humans asking for mercy for other humans, right? And the fact that God will actually kind of shift and say, okay, well, you know, if there are 20 righteous people, 10, 15, whatever, whatever, um, 
I find that troubling on the theological scale, the, the notion of God's, like ha a, a God who can change God's mind. But then when I think about it in terms of the exchange that we are able to have with the divine, I actually, that's the parts of scripture that I, I have to keep in there. Because if the conversation isn't open, that to me is terrifying and not good news for me as a reader. Um, so that wasn't two examples, but it was one, okay. Do I want to jump in? You sure. have to jump in? I have to jump in. Okay. So I think I was trying to, uh, looking at this question last night, I remember reading the Bible as a young person, and I came to the uh, passage in um, Judges about the concubine, and I was throttled by that and have ever since found that violence in the Bible was always problematic and will continue to be. But then what I found was that maybe it was put there for a reason, so that we would be less violent or we would be people who would see violence for what it is. And God, so the question, so the struggle though sometimes comes, I think Charlene touched on it very briefly, from a pastoral standpoint, is when you have to preach on these things in, in contrast to when you're in a Bible study with a group of people talking about them, it becomes another issue because then you are asked to say something to the community on be, of the word that would speak to that. And so when a violent text comes up, that's when I really do struggle uh, what, to, what to do with this, especially at, ver at various <laughs> different levels. Um, but I would say that, that there is some truth to the fact that the very things that one struggles with in the Bible can be sometimes the very texts that are become meaningful to you. Uh, for example, I'll go back to, to pick up what Charlene was talking about, you know, that, that when Abraham's bargaining with God, that was an eye-opener for me years ago, too, to realize that, well, does that keep the door open for us? Well, of course it does. It's, it's actually not only, it's more than an invitation, it's kind of a, a call mm -hmm. into that space to be prayerfully mediating on behalf of people who may not know their right hand from their left hand, what they're doing and, and what's wrong. So I think that's, um, it's, it's those passages where I would say the passages that have meant the most to me are those that have a lot of dramatic tension mm -hmm. and bid God's presence for resolution of some sort or another. And I think that, you know, that's kind of a broad statement because it kind of goes across the scriptures, but the, and probably that word helped open to me the Bible is to read it as a drama that's going on rather than simply as an instruction book that was kind of telling me how to figure out how to get through life mm -hmm. um, that put a different cast on it. Mm -hmm. Tom? <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping Michelle would go there. <laughs> Tom, playing my water bottles over there. Okay, yeah, no, I have one somewhere. So I would agree with the violence thing. I, I wish it wasn't there. Um, it doesn't really make sense, that much sense to me. The thing, that, although you can figure it out just in terms of human, the way God is dealing with humans, uh, but you take that the next step into the New Testament and you have a father who is letting his son get killed. Mm. And that also is disturbing to me. Um, now, I can put it in the context of uh, sacrifice and what God is doing, and, uh, and I can accept it uh, and thank God that it happened, but it's still a bit disturbing. Um, so that's that. The other... Um, thing that used to most of my life disturb me was the um, different presentations of Jesus with the same stories in the Gospels. Because if you look at the Gospels simply historically, literal, literally historical in every aspect, then you have to choose who's right, who's wrong. Uh, it's not just different views of the same thing. No, they're, they're so different, who's right and who's wrong. And I don't think that's what Scripture is meant to do. So for me, that was problematic. And until I began to understand a little bit more about genre and about how these fit into Greco-Roman biography and so forth, 
uh, it, was dis it was always disturbing to read the Gospels. I, I tried to stay away from the Gospels as much as possible. Uh, I'll read, How'd that go for you? Know, you? I'll read Paul and I'll, you know, but um, they were just, I love the stories, but. Yeah, and the Old Testament. Do you see how he didn't mention the Old Testament? Okay, so that's why I just stayed with John. Okay. <laughs> The gospel John. They're just nice stories, and there's some challenge there, and Jesus does some things that I wish he hadn't done, you know, uh, telling people their debts, the devil, and so forth. But for the most part, they're nice stories, and they're long, and you can kind of get into them. And, okay. And any positives? Oh, positives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You did get a PhD in New Testament, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> Um, for me, the positive in Scripture, especially, well, I'll just say Scripture, uh, is the heart of the gospel is that God loves everybody, that God's love is so deep and broad and wide that it includes me and it includes anybody else um, who's ever walked the face of the earth. That, and, and so the challenge, that the good news of that is that that's not in question. God's love is universal. The question um, comes up then, how, how can I live that out? And, and what does that mean in this particular case and this particular person? If I don't love them, how could God love them? Uh, and it should be the other way around. If God loves them, then I need to learn how to figure that out. But, but for me, the heart of the gospel is is really fabulous and uh, all-inclusive, and I want to be there. Yeah. Yeah, so I really resonate with, I think, comments that have already been shared about the paradox of um, as soon as you are ready to just kind of walk away from scripture and be like, how do I make sense of this? How do I justify this? Um, you're met with, uh, with other voices. So I would say... Um, you know, there are narratives in scripture that I think all of us either avoid or we cringe at or we skip over really quickly. And I'm thinking about those, those narratives um, that, for example, kind of are thin religious justifications for human <laughs> sinfulness yeah. um, that we see kind of blatant nationalism show up, right? That um, we see God not only condoning violence, but actually commanding it in harem warfare. Like, don't leave any Canaanite women, children, men, animals living. Um, and actually Saul getting punished when he does just that. And you're like, this is God's command? Really? Mm -hmm. um, or, or kind of anti-foreigner xenophobia of, you know, the prophets actually saying, like, you intermarried, leave your wife and children. Um, and this is actually God's will. This is what righteousness looks like. Um, or, you know, moving into the New Testament, we see, um, you know, patriarchy rear its head and specifically in some of the epistles with, you know, women um, remain silent, be submissive. We see hierarchy also play out with um, actually condoning slaves. Like, this is how you serve the Lord. You serve your masters. And what do we do with that? And yet, I think as I've dwelt and wrestled and adventured with scripture, I also see that it's not monovocal. There are counter narratives throughout right. scripture right. um, so that we actually see, for example, um, with the anti kind of immigrant that right there in the law, it's like you shall care for the stranger because you yourselves have been strangers in a strange land. Um, we see right alongside the prophets, Ezra and Nehemiah, who are like, get rid of all the foreigners. We see stories like Esther and Ruth, mm -hmm. um, who are models of actually faithfulness um, that become kind of ideals for uh, God's people. Um, and we see those actually playing out in the genealogies of Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think as soon as we're ready to just assume that there's one voice in scripture, I think, um, I'm encouraged to see that, no, we need all of these voices to come together and inform one another. Right. Um, and, you know, we see, uh, you know, that there is neither slave uh, nor free, women nor men. Like, there are 
Um, there are voices that are expansive. And so to put them in conversation with one another and to actually say, okay, where are, where is God challenging us? Where do we find ourselves and our own inclinations in scripture? And where are we being invited to, to have an expansive, yeah. all-encompassing vision um, that we see throughout the arc of scripture? Thank you. I hope you catch how wise these responses are. Um, they're blowing me away. So thank you all. Um, I want to push, this is a question you weren't all expecting, so I'm just going to push a little, little further. Everyone, I think, could probably, at least I'll say this way, um, if someone asks me about the Bible, there are certain passages that just pop into my mind as things I just, that have been super influential in the way that I uh, encounter the world um, because they've become either my favorite story or a, a favorite image or whatever. So you've talked, most of you, in kind of general terms about both passages that are problematic, right, but also things that, that you find um, uh, deep resonance with. I'm wondering if you could just, like, be real public here and just say, what's your favorite thing in the Bible? I mean, just that's been really meaningful to you. Maybe it's a, a passage. I mean, Tom, you talked about the image of God's love being, you know, just overwhelming for everyone. I wonder if there's, like, you know, are there three to 15 verses somewhere that are just kind of your favorite place to kind of muse on what's there. I mean, for me, it's probably, you know, things like the year of Jubilee in, in Leviticus. It's things like um, the story of Zacchaeus, right? I'm just wondering if you have, you know, maybe one story that kind of always comes to mind as just something that's meaningful. You're nodding, Michelle, so I'm going to let you start. Well, it actually it came up in our worship today as a part of our benediction. I think for me, the call of Abraham, um, we see the mission of God start right there. Um, that, that God chooses this Canaanite, this um, non, um, he, he's not a God worshiper necessarily. He's not monotheistic yet, even if we look at scripture. Um, and yet God chooses this figure, not because uh, he has it all together, but because he says, okay, like, where should I go? Lead me. Um, and, and we see that God has tremendous blessing for him and his family, which will become Israel, the people of God, but it is always for the blessing of the nations. And I think um, as we see, I think when Israel, when we see Israel getting in trouble is because it forgets that broader calling. It, it remembers its own blessing mm -hmm. and then it's God's own people. And yet they forget that that call is in service um, to universal blessing. And I think um, we as Gentiles are recipients of that blessing, inclusion in this covenant um, through Jesus. And yet we too then are part of that covenant um, of being blessed that we might uh, be agents of that blessing in the world. So I think that has become um, just part of my paradigm of faith. Thank you, thank you. Tom? <laughs> Okay, I have three things, <laughs> okay. Um, in seminary, one of the texts that kind of prompted me towards the church was uh, the end of Galatians chapter six, do good to all people, but especially to the household of faith. Um, and I was dealing with that at the same time I was dealing with whether I wanted to be ordained and whether I wanted to go to the church. And so that became a critical uh, pointer in the direction I felt God was uh, leading me. Um, the second one is Philippians uh, 4.13. I can do all things through the one, the, the, the textual uh, differences through Christ, but the one, the Christ who strengthens me. Uh, I look at that almost uh, before I do anything, uh, at least anything of substance. Uh, so I think, okay, I, I don't know what to do, or I can't do this, or I, don't, I can't speak here. And I always go to that text and reread it and uh, find comfort and challenge in it. And then the, another intriguing part of the Gospel of John is the beloved disciple. Um, the beloved, so Janie and I have talked about this on numerous occasions, but what, what does the beloved disciple do? 
I mean, the beloved disciple doesn't give um, a, a testimony or a, um, a witness to Jesus like Martha does. Uh, the beloved disciple seems just to be loved, and that's it. Um, until you read the end, and I think there is a place where the beloved disciple shows up in terms of the gospel itself. But in the, in, in the text, there's nothing that the beloved disciple does like other people. Doesn't lead people, uh, doesn't uh, testify to Jesus or any of that. Like uh, the Samaritan woman would be a great example of somebody who really lives out their faith immediately and brings her whole community um, into understanding of Jesus as the Savior of the world. But the beloved disciple, and the only thing I think about the beloved disciple is the beloved disciple is simply loved by Jesus. Yeah. That's, and, and receiving that love has shaped and challenged and changed that person's life. And I think, although it's not in the text exactly, I think that that is then the Gospel of John that the beloved disciple is the witness underneath the ground of the Gospel of John. But in the text, uh, we don't necessarily get that. Mark, you want to jump in? Tom's got three. I got like six. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, the, for me, it's, it, there, when I ask, this, my, ask myself this question, what are, what are the scriptures that, that, that continue to kind of grab the core of who I am? Mm. Um, there are chunks. Like I can think of the servant songs in Isaiah and the Sermon on the Mount and mm -hmm. Philippians 3 and all those. But uh, this is more of a very personal direction. I still to this day can remember, and, and, and it's almost as if I, I begin thinking of the Psalms before I start reading them. There are phrases in the Psalms that opened up my understanding to myself and to other people and to God and to the world that I couldn't find anywhere else. Um, let, uh, send out your light and your truth and let them lead me was a prayer I prayed for years, mm -hmm. never knowing how it was being answered right in front of me on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, Psalms like Psalm 16, um, the Lord being my portion and my lot, uh, the, the desire to see the face of God and then connect that with this wonderful as a verse that I'm thinking about this week, connecting that with when Esau and Jacob meet one another and it says to see your face is to see the face of God and then to connect that with the parable, the prodigal son, when the father and the son's faces meet. Um, there are these, the Psalms probably more than anything have shaped my inner life and my thinking uh, just simply by reading them and praying them and continue to this day. And it just, when I think of the life of the suffering servant, I just can't not separate that from the Psalms and Isaiah and Jesus, right? And, and what's going on there and how to make that. So though that from a very personal standpoint, the Psalms probably are the, the, the part of the Bible that has influenced me the most. <laughs> yeah, I know, Chris. Mr. Old Testament. At least Psalms one thumbs there. up from Chris. Yeah, I know yeah. one thumbs up there. Um, I, I think I'm remembering the original question. I think, I think Mark rephrased it in the way that I was intending it, which is what's uh, something that's at but the you core of who you are. You know? you okay, so it. the core of who I am, yeah. <laughs> So He's, very said it personally, in, intimately for me, um, old, old, I mean, Old Testament to New Testament, it's going to be stories like Hagar's, mm. the adulterous woman, and the hemorrhaging woman. So I'll, yeah. I'll focus on the hemorrhaging woman who honestly does not even think she is worthy enough of Jesus's time to flag him down and ask for a miracle, and yet has such faith that she thinks if he, she can just touch the hem of his cloak that she could potentially be healed. And so, and so from the Old Testament to the New Testament, I see these passages. And of course, I'm going to just zero in on the women in, this, in Scripture, A, as a woman, but also because they are exceptionally marginalized in Scripture and in the culture and context that we're reading about in Scripture. 
Um, and how God's, so, so playing off of, you know, like being beloved just for, for no reason at all. And that for these people, that would be a very hard truth for them to accept, even in its goodness. Like who wouldn't want to just be loved? And yet for all the external forces, um, I mean, you have someone like Hagar, right? Who is, who is the, the slave woman of this family, who is hated by her master's wife because she was, a, I mean, all of, every odd stacked up against these people. And, um, and that God loves meet, God's love meets them in that really terrifying, vulnerable, sad space. Not just some neutral space. Um, that you are loved, right? Just as you are, but like even going farther than that. So the fact, I mean, I, I think it's so beautiful. I think of that scripture of, again, of the hemorrhaging woman and Jesus feels his power go out from him. And, and then what does he do? He says, who touched me? Right. And like, I, I imagine, so I'm like putting myself in her shoes. She must've been terrified. Like, oh shoot, I just got caught. And I'm about to get berated or punished. Like, I, who knows, right? Because she was, she stepped out of her lane and she was doing this thing. And, um, and that he loves her on the spot. And so I just think, it, it, to me, um, that kind of just inconvenient, out of your way, radical, illogical love just shows up time and time again in the midst of all the stuff that we've also been talking about that's incredibly um, difficult to reconcile, the violence, right? But it's also, that's why the love is that much more radical is because the context is, can be violent or unfair or unjust. And so it's not this perfect little situation in which God's love meets us. God, God's love meets us in the mire, in the muck. And so I, I just think her... Yeah, I just, she's, she's like my hero and also somebody I just relate to. Thank you. Oh. Before, so, you, before yeah, you leave, please. I just want to say, I like the Psalms too. <laughs> I just want to say. <laughs> Chris, Chris did not, Chris was like, eh, fine, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. that, that was actually Tom's textual variant, Chris. Yeah, right. <laughs> So before, before we open it up to any questions that you all have, I have one more sort of, you might call this sort of a meta question at a certain level. So as, as pastors who are charged with guiding and leading and forming us as a community called into participation within God's larger purposes, within God's mission, how would you hope as a pastor that as a community, we would understand the nature of Scripture, that we would read and make use of Scripture, both individually and together. And, and I'll put this in a slightly different way if this helps. How do our sometimes challenging and stretching conversations about Scripture help us to discern together what God's up to and where and how God wants to lead us now and into the future? So I'm sort of asking you kind of as a pastor, how do you see Scripture um, playing a role, needing to play a role in, in our lives, both individually and together. Kind of, so this is more the sort of meta level pastoral guidance about what scripture is, what it does, how we approach it and those kinds of things. So I'll just let anybody jump in at this point. As the, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do a cheesy, but true answer. I think scripture is the greatest love story that has ever been told. Um, and so, which I think we're like, oh, like that's, yes, I can, you know, um, consent to or affirm that answer. And yet, so often we treat it as um, a manual, um, a self-help book, uh, a list of doctrine. Um, and while I think that truths, like in the same way for a great love story, you can deduce really beautiful truths from the love story. Like let's say we were listening to the love story of Byron and Jan Brown, and I could deduce from that story that 
Byron loves Jan, that Byron is loyal, that Byron is trustworthy, that Jan is um, patient and kind. Con- Jeez, what I just did there. That Jan <laughs> is, you know, and all of these things. Um, so truth can be pulled from a story, but a story is dynamic and alive. Right. And um, not for us to, in the same way that we would never do this to the Browns, to lay it and cut it up and um, slice it out for our, own, for our own purposes. But to be recipients of love stories, I think is different than to be um, like consumers of, of instruction or truth. Um, and so I think that kind of answers both of the questions. That you mm-hmm. So for me, I would say personally and as a congregation, the, the biggest fear I have is that we'll trivialize scripture. Mm that will take it and think about it as, oh, this is a nice thought for the day, um, and then move on to the next one, to the next one. Whereas I think scripture is meant to form us. I think it's really discipleship literature. I think I said this before, but it's discipleship literature. That is, we're to learn and to be formed and shaped by it, and it's not simply uh, a nice thought for the day. Oh, be kind. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot to be kind yesterday. I'll be kind today. Uh, and then forget that tomorrow or something like that. No, it's, it's that which shapes who we are and how we interact in the world. And I think my fear is that we'll either trivialize it or misinterpret it, but misinterpreting it is different than trivializing it. Um, so I think that would be my biggest fear about how we approach it. My, similar to to play off what Tom's saying, my concern would be is that we would, in our conversations about it, we would get wrapped up in the interpretation sometimes and not simply know the content. Because to truly interpret something, you need to know the content. I would assume that many of the people in this room, given your age and your where you've been in the church, you probably know a good bit about the Bible and what's in it. Um, But there is a part of the church that needs to know more about what's simply in the Bible. And I think that's important, even though I don't want to treat it as simply uh, um, in in one level as one book, because it's not that. But, Michael, I was thinking, I hope this uh, touches your question, as you look towards the church. I was thinking, you know, there's a lot of talk about, like, what's the future of the church? And um, I'm thinking, when I go back to Scripture, what's Scripture saying to me? And the way in which I've come to read the Bible more now is to look for patterns. And one of the patterns you will see in Scripture, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, is the cruciform nature Mm -hmm. of the servant of God. And the future, that's the future of the church. We just don't know what the particulars are of that. But it's not going to be a tyrannical, controlling, authoritative power of the servant, whether it's in Isaiah or in the New Testament with Jesus. So I, so I, I look for that to see if, if there's clues in Scripture that help me kind of link up with what's going on in our time. Um, and where do we see that? And where is it evidenced? And where is God calling us to be? And maybe because I'm aware of Scripture, and reading it and thinking and praying through it and letting it bubble up during my day, it's going to help me as a pastor lead the church in terms of what I see in your life or in this community. You know, part of the discussions, I'll just push the little edge that we've been having is like, what does it mean for First Press to not only simply be a mission station to the world, but what does it mean for us as a congregation to be a part of this community? Where do we see that? Where do we see evidence of that? Examples of that in Scripture, and what does that mean? That's kind of the cutting edge of my thinking right now. Yeah, I would just add that I think um, so often, particularly as modern readers, we come to the text and we feel like we have to either justify it or make sense of it. Um, particularly those troubling areas that we've talked about a little bit and. I think, I hope what we've explored this year is that actually scripture doesn't have those anxieties for itself. And 
It doesn't seem that God has those anxieties for scripture, as this has been the, the mechanism through which God has chosen to reveal um, God's hopes and hurts and dreams for the world. Um, and so to kind of free ourselves of this need to have to justify or explain um, or, or take at wholesale scripture, um, and I think what comes with that is actually this freedom to do what we see time and time again throughout scripture, which is to wrestle with God, to have dialogue with God, where maybe we push back on scripture, where we say, okay, tell me more, where we're that scribe coming to Jesus and saying like, yes, I know it says here, but what about this? And what I see throughout scripture, Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, is that God always welcomes that. And the people who engage never walk away the same. Um, you know, Jacob wrestles with God and walks away with a limp, um, but with also a new identity. The scribe walks away um, not with the easy answer that he wanted, but with um, a, a transformed mm -hmm. worldview or an invitation into it. And so I would say the, the same for us, that we can take scripture so seriously that we um, can meet it on its own terms and wrestle with it and meet a God who wants to expand our notions of scripture and about God's very self and ways in the world. Wow, thank you. So thank you all. And um, we'll come back for one last question. But this is a time now for any of you to get to ask any of them anything you want relative to Bible. And that could be how it functions uh, for uh, them, how it uh, guides uh, you and or some confusion about something about the Bible, maybe something that we've raised during these years, uh, discussions and panels that's kind of been sticking in your craw in one way or another, and you want to wrestle with that a little bit more and, and have them sort of weigh in. Now's your chance. So um, we do have two mics here. I realize this feels a little formal given that we're um, a small group. I have legs and a mic, so I can come to you as well. I, I think that would probably work. I don't know if that'll be on camera like it's supposed to be or not, um, or audio. Um, does anyone have a question or a thought or something that you would like to pose? Yeah, Doug. Um. In the context of in the context of all the time and resources you've invested in the Emmaus community life, um, what did you hope or expect from this, and how has it played out? And then, now that you've trained us or prepared us, what do you want to do with us? It's mm, a great question. It's a great question. Um, yeah, thank you, Doug. I think for me, um, and in initial conversations with Michael, you know, we were um, at a local restaurant talking about, okay, where do we go this year? Like we were um, in the midst of pandemic still, we were still on Zoom and lockdown. Um, what is the most pressing need? And I think um, as we look at these last two years, um, I think many of us have, have just kind of done away with easy answers, right? Like, Life is complicated. We um, have been kind of accosted by, um, by injustice, by evil, by pain and death in the world in ways that hit closer than home for many of us um, previously. And so how do we actually navigate that as people of faith? And how does scripture meet us there? Um, and how to actually be better readers and interpreters and doers of scripture. Um, and so rather than simply reading scripture, um, we wanted to kind of, I wanted us to, uh, to zoom out and say, how do we even approach this text? Because we have such reverence um, for it, how do we better read it on its own terms? And so I think all of these conversations, uh, looking behind the text to better understand the context um, out of which it, it develops, um, looking at the text itself really carefully um, and paying attention to what's there, um, being mindful of how we ourselves approach the text and how that shapes the questions and the assumptions we bring. Um, I think wanting to actually 
I don't think we really introduced anything new. <laughs> I think, um, I hope that you all have experienced that you are bright, insightful people. <laughs> um, some of the brightest and most insightful that I've ever had the privilege of engaging with. Um, and these questions reside, on, reside in you and you've brought them to your workspaces, you've brought them to your social engagements, um, your activities, your parenting, and yet it often feels like we can't bring that same kind of insightfulness and questions to the text. And so I think my hope for this year was that um, we, can, we can trust scripture and the God of it enough to bring our hard questions to it um, and to bring the same kind of insightfulness um, that we bring to the other areas of our life to scripture as well. And my hope is that, um, that this informs I think the hard conversations and wrestling and discernment that we have um, in the world, and particularly about, um, I think, controversial topics in our society and within the church. Um, that it's not just when something controversial comes up that we say, okay, what does scripture say about this thing? Um, but that we can actually become better readers and hearers of scripture in general, so that when these things come up, we can recognize, oh, here's how my interpretation of scripture is being shaped and here's how where you're coming from that we can actually have kind of a higher level um, of of reading and engagement um, with scripture but also with one another um, as a community of faith so i wasn't a part of the planning of this at all i was just like a um a beneficiary of the amazing planning but i've been like truly benefiting from it and seeing so much of how its impact is is like trickling out throughout the congregation and what i think it's um what's been so powerful about these panel events and what's like kind of just the the vision for this year in in the emmaus communities is it capitalized i think upon something that the church and the country has been experiencing throughout the pandemic season not entirely related to the pandemic but also with ancillary events is that um, a lot of the things that we assumed to be reliable or true simply weren't, right? So whether it was like democracy or, um, you know, uh, health system, all of these things. Um, and, and I think that's actually a healthy realization is to say we come into these, like, for example, you know, 10 years, we would go to the, the polling station and vote and simply assume everything is going to work as it should. And now all of a sudden we see those assumptions were laid bare. And so even when we walk into a church, um, we, we have these assumptions about the Bible, about what everyone else is thinking about the Bible. And again, as we have seen in national politics, the church is not united on how it views God, scripture, et cetera, et cetera. And so if that's happening in the broader church, what's happening within our own church, right? Um, and uh, I, I think it, it didn't help that we were separated. It didn't help that there was a new person who came, who was preaching a lot. All of these things that we assumed to be like widely held approaches to scripture, theology, all that stuff, all of a sudden we're like, huh. And, and so I don't know about you, but a lot of times, even in the church, and I'm a pastor at a church, I get like this emperor's new clothes feeling where I'm looking around and I'm like, gosh, is like anyone else thinking this? Like, is anyone else seeing this or is it just me? And, and when I came here, I had to learn all new language. Like I did not know what an Emmaus community was. And actually it wasn't like, discernible even from that name as a church person what that meant right and so i'm having to ask lay all of my kind of like the things i don't know or know on the table and then start fresh and so what has been so amazing to me about these conversations is that um no one is assuming and maybe this was happening before that mark and i agree on all the things and tom and michelle and i or that we disagree on things. So for example, even though I, uh, I preach a lot on the Old Testament, it doesn't mean I don't love the New Testament, right? And so all of these things put out then enables us to be honest about the things that we are doubting, scared about, angry about, and, and, and start from that place of, okay, we, we can actually be at different points on this, on something as critical as scripture within the Christian tradition, and still be okay 
together. And so that one has been a really powerful thing to just witness. And a lot of me witnessing that within, in community has been seeing it in the Zoom chat and just seeing how people are reacting and saying, okay, this was the thing that was like hard for me or powerful for me or um, comforting for me, um, which means it's been in the room the whole time. I would just say, in terms of like where we go, where you would go, like you raised that question, Doug, I'm looking at the word adventure, adventures with scripture, and I'm thinking about like from the beginning of the year when we got together in Emmaus communities, was there a passage, was there one week that really intrigued you and wet your appetite or inspired you to, I want to find out more about like where that, where that trail goes, right? And turn it, please turn your life with scripture into an adventure mm -hmm. and not simply a battleground for ideas, right? And that's, that's one I would, what I would say is where I would hope one to go. I would just say, I, th I wasn't part of the planning either, but the goal for and me that would idea. be <laughs> that we ask the question, what is scripture pushing me to do or to yeah. be, as opposed to what is this teacher or what does this pastor right. want me to do? The, the real goal is to be able to engage with scripture in such a way that we can answer the question, here's what scripture is pushing me, here's what God in scripture is pushing me um, to do or to be, as opposed to waiting for somebody to tell me what to do or to be. Which is, which is a very a relatively new thing, right, in the Christian tradition mm -hmm. in some ways, because for so long we've had, yeah, kind of leaders tell us uh, what to think do. Uh, Avon, I see a hand. Yeah. <clears throat> So in line with what Tom said, and in line with the, the doers of the word, not just hearers, can you think of an example in your lives where, you know, you, you read something in the Bible and you're like, I'm not convinced that <laughs> it's problematic, but you're going to be like, gosh, darn it, I'm just going to do it because oh. that's what I feel called to do. So um, if you can think in your life about experience or a passage that you were called to do and just did it. The way I understood what, what you were saying is, uh, given that we want to be not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word, are there passages that you find maybe troubling or, or challenging at points, but you've actually just decided I'm going to do it and, and try that out, uh, even if it troubles me a little bit. Yeah, something that you felt called to, to, to do, even it might be uncomfortable uh, at first glance as you interpret and so forth. That's a doozy. That's a good yeah, one. so I'm, uh, uh, how do I say this? I'm not, um, inherently or innately uh, wanting to serve the least of these, uh, whether they're on streets or whether they're, you know, somewhere else, I would much rather, and I'd like to say called, to think and study and then tell people what what the Bible says. So the challenge for I feel so, I feel your pain, Tom. Yeah. I feel your pain. <laughs> so the challenge for me is what do we do with our new neighbors? How do we relate with them? And uh, I've been incrementally, slowly meeting more and more of our new neighbors. Um, and I'm very happy to support people who work with uh, neighborhoods and send money and really guide us to care for the widow and the orphan and the stranger. It doesn't come naturally for me necessarily, and so, but, but it is so dominant in scripture. I mean, you can't, almost every page, you have to take this. So 
for me, the challenge is to actually live what I'm reading and what I'm thinking God is doing in the world and participating with God in the world. And that includes on Dana and Channing. And so that's been a real, um, that has pushed me uh, more and more to, to have different eyes and also have different feet and uh, to be taken in different places. Thank you. You know, so I think in this particular space, the EC panels, I've been very kind of vulnerable and frank about even my own journey with preaching, um, especially since I wasn't preaching at this um, rate or clip at my previous call. Um, and so it's been a huge growing edge for me. And, uh, and I mean, I think something that I actually kind of had an epiphany about in talking with Earl um, a week ago is how much the preaching context has changed. Um, given the fact that people have access to information, voices, Mark was just saying, everyone is on a pulpit these days, whether it's a podcast pulpit, a TV pulpit, a news, a journal, like everyone is, is teaching, talking, preaching at you constantly. Whereas there was a point in time where at church, this, the pulpit, the time spent in a sermon was, um, was almost set apart. Now it's a, one of many voices that we're all kind of yeah. consuming, whether we choose to or not on a daily, weekly, hourly basis. Um, and so in light of that, I think sometimes the, the pulpit is, is a, an intimidating and terrifying thing to me. I'm holding within the con congregation theological diversity, scriptural diversity, racial diversity, economic diversity, all of these things. Um, but something that kind of hit me was in the midst of, I guess, I get June 2020, this was after George Floyd's um, murder, was uh, the passage I preached on was the Isaiah passage that said, shout out, do not hold back. Um, and that is a hard thing for me. I, I'm not actually one who relishes an opportunity to get into the pulpit and just preach and disturb and disrupt. Um, but not to say that I don't feel convicted and have convictions about what God is calling the church to. Um, and so I, I read that and I was like, I, I think that there's part of me, whether it is, who, who knows what about it, it's, it's easier for me to stay silent because then I don't have to, to deal with all the feedback. Um, and scripture reminds me over and over again is that um, my, my allegiance is to God and the justice. I mean, what does God require of us, right? And that's to do justice and love mercy. And so to be able to, every single Sunday, it is trying to be obedient to that. Um, and it's not easy and it has, at times when I've wanted to stay silent, it has said, okay, nope, shout out, do not hold back. There, to, to get specific, there are three passages or phrases from scripture that have challenged me over and over again in my human relation, in my relationships, both within the church, my family, and others that I've had to really go and wrestle with God about obeying. The first is forgive as you have been forgiven. The second is speak the truth in love. And the last one is what do you have that you did not receive? <laughs> that right there, just those phrases just come back again and again as because probably in one of the hardest things to do, especially a pastoral ministry, and it's not just pastoral ministry, it's life itself is speak the truth in love because I want to love and I want to speak truth. I'm called to speak truth. Yet putting those two together sometimes can be volatile, inflammatory, right? Both within and without. And yet when God says, you now must speak the truth in love, kind of what you mean with shout it out, mm -hmm. shout it out. So for me, those are, but, but I, can, I can distinctly remember times, a specific one when a family member, young, when I was younger, a family member who had done something, a family member who was older than I, who had literally done something that was close to unforgivable, in the middle of cutting the grass at my parents' house, God like hit me over the head with that. You know, we, we talk about getting hit over the head with a brick or whatever. It was like, Mark, forgive as you've been forgiven. 
and I rediscovered my own belovedness and forgiveness, then extended it out. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't have discovered it by not following the word, right, and following them. Yeah, I think for me, um, something that I have been challenged with and am seeking, not that I have arrived, but that continues to challenge me is, um, as Tom mentioned, kind of this, this call a few weeks ago, maybe a month or two ago, we preached on that powerful passage of like, you say to me, Lord, Lord, but you know, I was sick and did you come and care for me? I was in prison and did you visit me? Um, and I, I say a lot of Lord, Lords, it's part of my job. <laughs> and yet, um, a few years ago was just struck by, you know, my engagement with the least of these is oftentimes at a stop sign. Um, and that is my interaction. <laughs> um, and then I go to work and I do the work of church and maintain this institution, um, and teach and preach. And those are important things. And yet, um, what does it look like uh, to live that out um, in my day to day? And actually, felt such a crisis of integrity that I like moved our family to a whole new neighborhood, and like we we're going to be part of this intentional community because I just felt this mm -hmm. tension of I can think a lot about scripture mm -hmm. and preach and teach and um, and sermonize, and yet. Um, the invitation is to how do I live this out? And I think that's always the invitation to God's people throughout scripture is, um, you know, like you can have your festivals, you can have your sacrifices, um, but what does the Lord require of you? And so I think that continues to challenge me um, and that looks different in different seasons of our lives. And yet, um, where is God calling me to, um, to live out my faith actively? So I want to I want to be conscious of our time. It is almost 12:30, and this is Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. And so, to all of you who are mothers, to both of the moms I'm sitting next to, to the mothering ones in our group, um, Happy Mother's Day to all of you. Mm -hmm. I want to say that. I also know that we may have a couple more questions. I don't know if you're all willing to take another five or ten minutes. I want to give folks who need to leave the chance to leave without judgment or, or awkwardness, right? But I, I'm, if you're interested and willing in staying another five or ten minutes, it looks like we have a couple more questions, and I'd like to at least honor those if we can. Is that fair? So if you do need to leave, please feel free to do so. Have a wonderful uh, ce celebration. Um, go ahead, Michael. Your time today and it's been wonderful. I was really impressed today with the university uh, mm -hmm. students today and their testimonies. I came here a few years ago. Um, my lovely wife Nina brought me here, and uh, I looked around. And it was just a lot of gray hairs, and there was no rainmakers I <laughs> could see. And now today, I see so much improvement of uh, youth coming into the into the congregation, mm -hmm. and it's just wonderful. I um, I'm, I'm blessed by that. I I, I just started. Uh, thinking about um, that uh, uh, the university folks, how, how are we seeding that? I remember I, I'm talking to a lot of people and I understood that they uh, were inspired years ago by, by focus groups and how this church was a university church. And many of them said, you know, the, how the focus groups on Wednesdays, they, they, we were 150 students in, in the class and, and, and just we couldn't find space for them. And now there's maybe a dozen. Yeah. And I'm just curious as to uh, what are the university students asking these days that are, are, is so important to them uh, that, that we can help them to understand that scripture uh, applies to us today as it did 2,000 years ago because there's so many, the answers are all there. But um, what can we do to attract it? Uh, Mark Leverton led uh, many of those groups. I understood, uh, I don't know much about that years ago, but. Um, I, I understand that, uh, you know, how can First Pres stand out amongst, now there's over 150 groups at the university for every kind of religion and every kind of uh, problem that there may be in you, mankind from, you know, from uh, racial to, uh, uh, to abuse to so many different questions and, and there's all these groups. How, how can 
what can First Press do to uh, uh, be a, 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 a beacon of light to help these students understand and answer their questions that they have today? Sometimes it's not just who Jesus is, it's like, how in the heck do I get through what I'm doing? And, and that starts the conversation that will right. then lead us to the Bible and, and lead us to, uh, to Jesus' uh, words and also the, the Old Testament that so brings so true to all of us. Thank you. I mean, I could spend hours, this is what my doctoral work is on, is ha the, gener the generational changes within the church. And so, um, for example, the attendance numbers that you cite are from a generation in which students were going to church and um, pews were full. And, um, and so the, the kind of cultural changes that we're experiencing at First Press are not unique to First Press. Like we're seeing it, I mean, you can just, I, in, pre in preparation for my sermon today, I just Googled um, gen current generation, Gen Z. Just, I wanted to know what years it covered. And the first thing that popped up, and obviously this is because my algorithm has to do with a lot of religious searches, it's at least religious generation in history. And do you know what the before them the least generation was? The one right before it. And then the one right before it, right? So each emerging generation is becoming less and less religious. Um, and so it is, uh, again, we were just talking about this this morning, it's not even, uh, for, for us to attract university students, we're not even starting at a neutral and saying, come check out church. We are having to fight against decades and even centuries of bad press for these individuals who have seen the church stand as a monument of um, exclusivity, oppression, judgment, all of these things, right? And so, for example, the amount of, when, when I was doing my work with young adults and my research, so much of it was, was actually just therapy and support groups reclaiming scripture. So it wasn't even a matter of knowledge of scripture. They did not want to deal with it because it had been used in their minds as a weapon. Right? And so I think the question that you ask is, is actually the answer. We need to be asking this generation, what is it you are seeking in life? I mean, like, not even faith, right? So, so for example, that used to be kind of a normal thing, a status quo thing to have a faith tradition. It's not anymore. So that's not even a relevant, that, that, quest that question comes with assumptions that are no longer true. Um, and so what, I mean, we're also seeing the highest suicide rates, the highest depression rates, the highest anxiety rates in our youth. So we know that the need is there. And so the question is, where is your pain? Where is your sorrow? Where is, where is hope? What do you hunger for? And I think those questions have the opportunity to teach the church. Um, and so if we're willing to have those conversations, now then taking the answers to that question, to those questions, and then spinning it into a ministry, that, that takes time and humility and flexibility and ad adaptability. So in terms of, is there something, is there a magic answer in which changes the, the direction in which the church has been heading in? Um, not a fast one, um, but what we are seeing is our presence out there, as Josh mentioned, the first and third Saturdays of the morning is intriguing and curious to a generation of people who are like, wait, why are we feeding people for free every, you know, the first and third Saturday of every month. Hmm, can you tell me about that? Um, and so in that regard, going back to the very old adage, they will know us by our love, I think it's definitely proving to be true. And we're even seeing in Bianca's testimony, it was because we were a community that accepted her as she was. Um, and so I, I find the generational, I mean, that, that requires great humility on behalf of the church to say, because it, even though it worked in my time, does not mean it's going to work in the times to come. Um, and, and so how do we hold on to what is good and honor tradition and also be willing to learn and adapt, I think is the true challenge for, for the generations to come. Because that's Gen Z. We're still um, in the midst of crisis with the generation that comes before, which is the millennials, right? And so you look around and you say, where are the young families? That's another question. I mean, we can, we're going to continue to ask this now with each successive generation, which is, which, on, which is on the one hand terrifying and overwhelming, and on the other hand, very, very exciting. 
I would just add, um, I think the question is where we have to start and where we have to stay. Um, I think so often the church is kind of like, okay, what do we do to get them in the door? Um, and then we keep them on our terms. And I think mm-hmm. um, for young adults, um, sticking with their questions and saying, no, what, do you, what is your experience? What are you wondering? Um, and actually letting go of our assumptions and our paradigms of how ministry has been done in the past. Um, and I am thinking about where our university students are, and I believe that the most popular minor at Cal is peace and conflict studies. Many of these students don't come from, um, you know, faith traditions or religious upbringings, but like they are passionate about peace and conflict studies. Um, And I think to Charlene's point, um, I think the beauty of this community is that we are a Jesus justice church. We are a yes and church and to help people understand that um, that we seek out the, seek out justice and um, and peace in our world, not simply for its own ends, but because we serve a God who wants to see flourishing. Um, and we don't work out of our own strength, but we work in partnership with this God who is doing this thing, and we get to be a part of it. Um, and I think that is an amazing invitation for our students. I think particularly for a generation that is overwhelmed by just how broken the world is um, on every level and to hear the gracious message that we are a part of it, but it is not ours to fix. We don't have to bear the whole weight of the world. Um, We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us and we get to be a part of that. And I think that's particularly a message that this generation needs to hear um, because the, the hopelessness and the just the scale of the issues feels so overwhelming. Um, And so to be part of a community um, that is not only doing this work, but that recognizes that it's part of a bigger story. Um, And I think that's something, um, I I hope you heard it today, I certainly did, um, that the intergenerational nature of the church is unique. um, And that you have people pouring into each other's lives that it's not bait and switch like come to our church to be a part of our programs it's like no we actually love and care for you (laughs) as a human being Um, and I think that that is something that the church is uniquely poised to offer that kind of intergenerational community um, that is finding its life and its strength um, to go back out into the world and to live out the story of which we're a part I would just say that there are generational issues that Charlene has said. I think there are also some specific historical issues here that we are dealing with. But I think one of those is that the church in the future will not look like the church of the past. And we're trying to figure that out. We talk about that every time we meet as a, as a mission outreach, which includes university students and young adults. And what is the church going to look like in two years, five years, ten years? What is well, my experience of the church was really a very important part of my life and development. I don't think the church in the future will look like what I experienced, yes. but we don't know what that's going to look like yet. Yeah. And we're trying to live into that, and that in itself uh, is a challenge, but an exciting challenge, like Charlene has said. So. We'll see. No, it's all been said. Okay. Well, it's said well. Well, let, let, me, let me close <clears throat> us. And, and if I can just toss out one little Please. thought here in light of a couple things that, that you said, because I do teach Bible uh, to this generation. Um, and so everything that you've all said, I think, resonates a ton. One thing I would, I would just add kind of almost at a personal existential level is... Um, You know, Michael, your question is so good and so and impressing us so so importantly. I one of the things that strikes me is that the way I grew up in the church um, and the way the Bible was was dealt with um, in my growing up is that any questions I had about life, I was told the answers in the Bible. Just find the right place in the Bible, and you got the answer right. Mm-hmm. And 
it was a sort of almost bait and switch in the yep. sense that I never entirely felt like I was cared for just because I was. It was sort of like, come here and then we'll send you back out. Or a way we often talk about this uh, today, um, you know, with students is, and, and in psychology and so forth, the uh, counseling is, you know, the difference between listening to respond and listening to understand, mm. right? Um, I think students today, young people today, I think all of us, if we're honest, want to be understood, mm -hmm. right? We don't necessarily want to be responded to mm -hmm. in a kind of way that doesn't really hit at the depths of, of where we are. And so one of the things that's most excited me in conversation with Michelle and, and all of us is, is the fact that scripture isn't simply a set of answers but it's something that pushes us to be more honest about the right kinds of questions. And it, mm -hmm. it poses questions to us that are deeper even than the questions we might pose to it. Um, it's not just responding to us, right? But it is, it is actually understanding us. And so I guess what I would encourage us to do is not what was done to me when I was a young person, which is sort of to, you know, the, the kind of you know, altar callish kind of thing. Here's the Bible. It will answer all your questions next, right? And kind of move on. Um, because because what, what struck me was the fact that, that it was not the people that felt like they had all the answers to give me, but it was the people who were willing to spend the time with me to hear where I was and not simply tell me what the answer was right. as, as much as we might want to kind of rush to those things. I think we have to point people to what is in scripture, what the spirit is doing um, in our community and so forth. Um, but how we do that is also critical. And mm. I think you've all spoke to that. So anyway, this concludes our time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, let's give a round of applause to our panelists, our pastors. And our moderator. And Michael. And our moderator. Yes. Thank you, Michael. You're all so sweet. And again, a very, very happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and those who do mothering in all kinds of ways in our community. We love you all and uh, look forward to uh, more conversations maybe in the future and in other contexts. So mm -hmm. thank you all. Have a great, a great week. Thank you.